all markets in distress go from undervalued to fair value, which I just suggested, the fair value of silver, to overvalued. And where we're headed is going to take silver to an overvalued condition, say with coal. On behalf of SDBoying.com, this is James Anderson. We are about to speak with silver investment guru David Morgan of the MorganReport.com about his top 10 rules for silver investing. This interview will provide valuable insights for both new and veteran silver investors alike, so stay tuned. Before we go further, though, if you'd like this content, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe to our SD Bullion YouTube channel so you get our latest market updates and content. With all that out of the way, let's speak with the silver legend himself, Mr. David Morgan. Hello there, this is James Anderson on behalf of sdbullying.com, and I'm pleased and thrilled to have with us David Morgan of morganreport.com. David, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I know that um, you know the silver investment saga continues. We've been, you've been in this for decades, and I've been in this for over a decade, and I really admire all your work, and I figured today would be a great time to just give a general synopsis of your 10 rules for silver investing, so anyone coming into this market can kind of get a general idea of how to do this safely and intelligently. So thanks for coming on today. Well, James, thanks for having me. And this is, you know, not the mutual admiration society, but I must say that you've done some killer videos over the years. I mean, really killer. You've brought things together that maybe others haven't seen. I mean, you brought parts of the market together and explored that, I think, to give a new look and a hard one and a very accurate one uh, for people, whether they're brand new or seasoned investors such as myself. 10 rules, pretty simple. I was known on the internet a little bit and the investing rules book that I don't think it's even published anymore, but they put out the top investors for different segments being like real estate, mutual funds, options, limited partnerships. So they contacted me and said, what do you do? The 10 rules of silver investing. And I said, sure. And I said, make sure it's pithy. So I go, okay. So I guess without further ado, we can go through them. And the purpose of it really was to help people. So the first rule, and I really wanted to impact everything from you know the first rule. I mean, if you read nothing more than the first rule, and hopefully you read all 10 and apply them, it's like punch in the mouth. You know, it's like, here it is. I'm not holding back. So rule number one, when all else fails, there is silver. No one likes to be a prophet of doom. But the simple truth is silver is the world's money of last resort. Should a severe economic collapse occur, leaving paper assets worthless, silver will be the primary currency for purchase of goods and services. Gold will be a store of major wealth, but will be priced too high for day-to-day -day use. Thus, every investor should own some physical silver, and store a portion of it where it's accessible in an emergency. Yeah, that lends itself to Milton Friedman's quib that silver uh, historically has been mankind's money more so than even gold. Uh, if you look at overall history and transaction volumes, et cetera, silver totally out, out volumes to gold in terms of turnover. I would imagine if you look at a historical um, amount that has been used just in various societies. So it makes total sense. Um, all else fails, there's going to be silver no matter what. Yeah, I can explore a little more. I've used that quote from Milton Friedman in the past, but this idea that everyone should have a little has been batted around. I did a video that's still available. In fact, it's one of the ones that's most frequently watched called Myths in the Silver Market. And what that myth is, is that what if everyone owned a little? And I go through the scenario that if everyone in the United States owned a little silver, an ambiguous term, so I use two ounces, which is, I would consider a little amount. We're talking about, you know, maybe 60 bucks at $30 silver, certainly not going to change your life. If everyone owned a little, just the United States owning a little silver, everyone would be the, basically the mine supply. And when I made that video, it was about two ounces. Now it'd be about three ounces. But the point is that not everyone can, not everyone will, but not everyone can own a little silver. So, this idea isn't really explored that much, from my opinion, where, oh, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's as if it's like our whole society, from my framework, James, where just in time inventory, you yeah, know, it works great until it doesn't. Yeah. And that's where we are right now. For silver is that spades, because when you may need it the most, 
the price may be out of reach, or as Mike Maloney said so many times, it's un unobtainable. Right, <laughs> unobtainium <laughs> silver, no doubt. Um, so yeah, so I just saw today recently, the Silver in in Institute just released a, uh, a press release talking about near record investment demand, 263 million ounces, their forecast for the year. And they mentioned something about India, you know, being one of the major things involved with the silver investment demand. India has not been involved in the last two years at all. They've been offline. And all this, all this near record and record silver investment demand has been Western driven. Uh, what happens if India comes on and actually wants to make up for some of that lost uh, supply that they were not getting in the last two years? I mean, this, this market is not ready for that. Yeah, I've said for years, and I haven't said it often, but I, I think what we're going to see is what yeah, I've called, or actually James Dines was the first one, so I'll give credit where credit is, it's called a natural squeeze. Mm. What's a natural squeeze? Well, it's industry's absolute need for silver, otherwise they're out of business. So that's at least half the equation. And the other part of the natural squeeze is what is the true uh, need, I'll say, or the must have for silver? And when real money is the only thing left standing, it's an infinite need. <laughs> if your bank account is a million dollars and you know it's going to half a million in you know three months, whatever. In other words, when the fear of the system gets pervasive enough, which may be only 1% of the population, it spills over and becomes 5, 10, 15%. Mm -hmm. When that happens, it's an infinite demand for money that works. Mm -hmm. And so you've got, the bifurcation, you've got both the investment side and the uh, industrial side playing for a very, very limited asset. It's uh, something that I think will happen, unfortunately. I mean, I say unfortunately because the system is so corrupt, it's going to end. It is ending before our eyes, really. It does need to be redone, certainly not in the WEF format, but uh, I think we're getting closer daily. So moving on, the uh, number step number two, we're talking about starting small and keeping it simple. A lot of people, you know, they learn about, you know, the Federal Reserve not being federal and there's no reserves and everything that, you know, you've taught, Mike taught, I've said. And they go all in, you know, oh, I'm going to start be on my own gold standard. I'm going to start my own silver standard. So they jump in, they buy too much, buy the wrong kind. They don't time it or whatever. So I just talk about, you know, avoid you know, some of the decorative items, jewelry, other collectibles, and, you know, stay away from large premiums and start small. If you don't know how to swim, you don't, you know, run for the Olympics two days in, right? It's like anything in life. So I say, keep it simple, start small and learn the market. Find a dealer that you can trust or dealers that you can trust, form relationships, start small and slowly acquire and move into a position. It takes time though, you know, don't do it all at once. So we're moving on to the boost. Boost the purchasing power of your dollars with mining shares. So perhaps get some leverage on some of these bets for silver. It's a little self-serving because I do write a report that deals mostly with the equity side, but uh, I'm not even sure I had, I guess I had started the business by the time I wrote this. Regardless, uh, I've always advocated, as you well know, and I want to say it again. Look, I always say that if you are going to be in the precious metals, you need metal. And that's it. You don't need mining shares. But if you have metal, I would almost wish, James, that I could and I can't, you know, put up a little, you know, quiz, you know, do you own physical metal? If so, <laughs> check the box. Yes. Now you're allowed to subscribe to the Morgan Report. Sure. I mean, I've had that thought more than once, but you do get leverage and, you know, good or bad, it's a reality. I remember speaking at the uh, Mining Association over in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, early in my career. You know, I had more hair. I was a little more juiced up in those days. But this old crotchety old miner came up to me after the talk and he goes, you know what? What? And I'm always open minded, especially people who have been in the field. And so I always made more money in paper silver. <laughs> I'm thinking futures, right? What you could do as well. And he talked about, you know, how many penny stocks there were in the Silver Valley at one time and how those things ran, you know, from 12 cents to 12 bucks and all that stuff that happens in a hot market, it's all true. You gotta be very careful, uh, which I try to be with the Morgan Report, but uh, yeah, you can gain leverage, but you also can you know, lose your horse in it too. You gotta be pretty smart about how you do it and when you do it, but uh, start with the real metal first. I still have a few subscribers, even though they know uh, 
that it's mostly equity based. I do give a big picture and I do timing. So some people have it just for that reason. Yeah, that makes sense. Obviously, you know, if you're invested in silver and it starts to go climbing walls in terms of value, uh, you know, selling into some of that escalation makes total sense using those proceeds to do other investments. Or, you know, at that time, I would imagine if you have the silver spot price climbing walls, you're going to have a huge flow into the mining shares. And so, you know, if someone like you, an expert who spends, you know, their time full time investigating these various companies, because most people don't have that time. And so having someone to do that and help in the process makes total sense. So I could I could totally imagine myself at some point selling out of some bullion and moving into some mining shares for that extra leverage kick as the mania is really getting going. So it makes total sense. And there is a PS to that. And I've done it many times, many of my early subscribers have. And that is you make it a, I don't know, make up a number, six fold gain in mining shares and silver's only gone up 30%. Uh, I've taken those gains many times and plugged it back into the physical market. And that makes you feel good. So you're, right. if you do the math, you're coming in, you're buying that, you know, $15 silver at equivalent of, you know, three bucks. <laughs> so yeah. It's cool. yeah. Crystallizing gains is always important. Uh, you know, you never go broke taking, taking profits. So, uh, rule four dollar cost average to lower your costs and increase your discipline. Yeah, it's only works in a bull market and we are in one. Yeah. And as I say, as I, you know, in that rule, you know, it gets rid of a lot of emotion. It teaches discipline. It's really a good way for most people to just get, you know, that, that constant worry about, did I buy it correctly? And, you know, things could, you can vary around that. But the idea that you just are saving for your future in real money You've made a plan, you've got an extra, just say a hundred bucks a month, and you just put it into the silver market and relax. Right. And if the market goes sky high on a, some type of reason, you might might want to load, lighten up some of it. Mm -hmm. Or if the market goes crashing down on one of these overnight raids and you've got extra capital, you might add to it. Yeah. But it's a really good way for most people just to really take a deep breath and relax. As we said, and I'll repeat a little bit in one of the earlier rules, you know, people get the idea of what's really going on and they're going to rectify the situation personally and jump in pad ass and spats, as they say, and realize they've gone too deep, too fast, too far and did the wrong thing. So this is the way to start simple and keep it going. Rule number five, do not get a raw deal from your dealer. I'm going to read that one. Sure. It's probably the most second most important other it's than, important. you know, rule number one. Sure. Because of the specialized nature of the physical metals market, selection of a well-established dealer and a quality reputation is essential. A good dealer will provide timely execution of your trades at fair prices with reasonable fees. Note as well that the lowest price is not necessarily the best price. In the past, some dealers who squeezed their price margins too low in order to attract clients were unable to make delivery, leaving those clients holding the bag. And I'll just add to that, James, I could cite many examples, but one of them was Tolving when I started the, you know, the, the Morgan Report. And I got a lot of, I used to have a little booklet, e-booklet, on what dealers I thought were the best. And people would buy, it was very cheap. I think it was charged at 15 bucks or something, I forget. And I, I took it off the web because many people were very upset that they didn't have Tolving in there. And I knew Tolving's background and I also wrote this rule, right? Yeah. And of course, when it works, it works. But then he went out of business again. He'd done, yeah. he'd done it previously. So be careful, you know? Um, doesn't mean you gotta pay the highest price dealer. And when I'm asked, you know, I try to spread it around. I some send some to SD, I send some to Mike. I said, and I try to fit the client to the dealer yeah. as best I can. And of course, the final choice is theirs. But you know, getting that that coin off of eBay, you know, buyer beware. I'm not saying you can't. You just got to know what you're doing. Right. Yeah, that's a. Uh... Fraud in precious metals is uh, the biggest one. I would say one of the hugest ways to lose your your capital. Obviously, uh, it's such an expensive uh, transaction typically, especially if you're buying gold bullion or silver bullion in large lots. 
And if things go really wrong, I mean, I've seen some real train wrecks and people losing seven figures of their of their capital up to six figures. I mean, their entire inheritance sometimes that they get from people getting taken advantage of by, by dealers who aren't doing the right thing. So that is a ongoing problem. And so people need to know who they're dealing with and, and need to know that they have proper track records, et cetera. And, and they're going to get a fair deal and not a raw deal, as you say in rule five. At the risk of looking a little self-serving again, I used to do consultations, James, as you know, and I took it off. I'm just too busy now to do it. But many of the consultations, let's say about 30, 40 percent were, hey, I trust you. Who do I buy from? I've got, you know, this amount. <clears throat> I don't want to make a mistake. And, you know, people say, well, geez, Dave, you're paying, you know, you're charging a lot for your uh, service. I do. <laughs> it's a reason. One, I can't answer the phone all day long. So if it was 10 bucks an hour, you know, <laughs> right. I never get off the phone. And two, someone that's going to put in, you know, anyone, I don't want anyone to be hurt, but let's just say you're putting in that inheritance. Hey, my brothers and sisters and I have decided we're going to put 10% of our portfolio in the metals market. We just inherited $2 million. Can you help us out? And the answer is yes. And I don't say you've got to go here. I say, you've got this, this, and this choice. You know, what do you want? You know, blah, 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 blah. So I'm not trying to be that self-promotional, but I am reiterating what you just said, James. Look, it's very important not to make a mistake. Uh, and I'll just go one step further. I had a gentleman call me years ago. Silver was still around six, seven bucks. And his uh, parents had just uh, immigrated from China. And they got a hold of one of these dealers who got them semi new massive coins. And they had a 40% premium. And they would only sell back at melt. And he was pretty upset because it's their life savings. They just got to America and Welcome to America. You've just yeah. been had, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I told him what a strategy, and of course, at you know, six or seven dollars silver, it wasn't a big deal, meaning that I knew the price was go higher to recover. But that's just an example of many like you that I could cite that people did not do well because they yeah. got anxious, used the wrong dealer, didn't think it through, had any experience or what have you. It's an unfortunate aspect about any industry in the United States. There are always good and bad actors. And what we're suggesting here is make sure you try and deal with the good actors. That's the, that's the bottom line. Rule six, what's yours is yours. So keep it that way. Sounds like you're talking about how you, how you store it. Let's talk a little bit about that. Cause it's an interesting topic. Yeah, boy, this one is tough. So, uh, well, it's wise to keep some of your silver where you can get at it easily, which goes back to rule number one. It's important to keep the bulk of metals in a safe place, especially as your holdings increase. However, if you establish an account with a brokerage warehouse or other public storage facility, you should make sure your holdings are kept segregated and that you can expect them when you wish. Pretty simple, pretty common sense, but so many people, and this is a pet peeve of mine, James, and I'm sure you could add on to it, have got accounts of... 250,000 in the metals, 2.5 million in the metals. I mean, there'll be some pretty heavy players out there, as you know. And they will seek a storage facility for like one quarter of 1% better than the other guy without taking into consideration all the factors I just outlined. Uh, I'll let you go through the allocated, unallocated, and segregated and the red flag that if you can inspect your metal, and that's a little tough to talk about what well, we can talk about it. It's a little tough to say, well, if you can't see your own metal, don't use them. I, I can't look anyone in the eye and say that's that's it, the case. But um, let me hand it over to you. Sure. Yeah. This is uh, first and foremost, when you get into the silver and gold bullion industry and you're taking, you know, physical bullion delivery, I would take at least a little bit in hand, hand directly the first time, just so you kind of understand what you're doing what the products look like, how it feels, the process of ordering, taking delivery, you know, and just understanding the kind of the way it operates. And then as you get larger and to a certain point, it becomes actually kind of risky to have all your eggs in one basket. So imagine having it all sitting in your house and then, you know, God forbid someone who perhaps cleans your house finds out that you have precious metals. And the next thing you know, something really bad could happen. You could have a home invasion or something like that. That has happened a lot in this industry. So being cognizant of A, who knows about you know, your physical precious metals, probably only your loved ones or people in your written will should know. Um, and that's it, you know, kind of keep your, your loose lips sink ships, right? I mean, so, so keep your mouth kind of quiet on what's ever held within your house. Uh, once you get to a certain threshold, though, the risk reward is a little bit too high to have it all in one spot. And so using uh, segregated 
not you know non-bank depository services is my suggestion strong suggestion for people once they get into the six to seven figure range for bullion it makes total sense to me because you should not pay more in terms of uh, fees than you would pay for an unsecured etf like a gld or an slv or an SIVR, any of these other things that are derivatives that you actually don't actually own any silver in, you're just holding an unsecured bag of derivatives that supposedly tracks the spot price. You should be able to find a segregated storage facility for silver or for gold that you can actually get at a price that's lower than the management fees of these ETFs that don't actually give you outright title. And you at these depositories have outright title with insurance. So I'm talking about secure logistic servers like 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 Brinks, uh, Loomis, Maka Mitts, there's a whole bunch g4s they're all over the world and in the united states too uh, i use loomis personally but there's a whole bunch and i like it because there's no dealer involved right so there's no conflict of interest there's no middleman between me and them i can reach out directly to them and say hey i'm coming to x facility in los angeles or miami and i'd like to come and see my medals and i give them a date and time and you know they allow me to come through and they, they roll out a cart and show me my precious medals and roll it back out and I say, thank you. And I go along my way. And every time I've ever dealt with these folks there, they've always been on the up and up and very professional. And that's the same with Brinks in Salt Lake City. Uh, you know, I've been involved in this industry for over 12 years and, you know, various Brinks in LA as well. Very professional. These people do have done this for, you know, these, some of these companies have been around over 130, 40 years. They're not going to risk the reputation over something very, very, you know, to them, it's kind of tiny to have just one segregated storage account that's even a million dollars. You're still, you know, one of many thousands around the world that has that. So they're not going to risk their name or their brand or their hallmark for that. And so they're going to they're going to take care of you and, and ensure everything there. So that's my suggestion. If you get to a larger level, start using professionals to to guard your metals and to do it outright directly if you can. Wow. Press <laughs> very succinct and well done and needed is very much needed in the, our industry. So, I want to put a little asterisk go and for delve it. a slight bit deeper. I want to talk about the uh, asset-backed cryptocurrencies. I'm involved in one, full disclosure, ag.load.one. That's ag.lode.one. It's a crypto that's backed by gold and silver. But what, in that footnote, <clears throat> if you could settle in the contract, when you sign it and you open an account, if you can be forced to settle for cash, you just bought a derivative. Right. Yeah, ultimately, if you see anything that says unallocated, um, if you see anything certificate wise, you know, they may say, hey, no storage fees, you know, no storage fees. <laughs> what do you think that means? You think it's free to just have people sitting around physical precious metals and guarding it, safekeeping it, making sure that it's fully insured? Now, that means you're probably giving them an unsecured loan and that if it goes wrong, they'll just turn around and give you cash, maybe if if they're still solvent, they may be bankrupt and you may get nothing. And so that, that is the right, you, you need to be absolutely certain that you buy a physical product and you have it delivered to a place where you can ensure by a third party that it is what it is and that it's there and being held at a price that's reasonable, you know, that's lower than the management fees of a lot of these ETFs. So um, it's good, it, it's good, it, it's very important. This is your bedrock asset. Make sure your bedrock asset doesn't disappear and poof a, a, on you when it really matters most, so. So moving on, let's uh, let's go to rule seven. Silver speculations like cough syrup, good in small doses, but too much can make your portfolio sick. I can speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was uh, from experience. You know, I was a bit of metals head from a very early age, sound money, hard money advocate for all kinds of reasons. And of course I got into junior mining stocks uh, without much education. So I got to the School of Hard Knocks and School of Hard Knocks is a pretty good teacher. So what I learned is uh, a lot of these, uh, what I call penny dreadfuls are not worth uh, the paper they're printed on. So you gotta be very careful. So when I started the Morgan Report, James, my, my actual belief at the time was I'm not gonna do any penny stocks. I'm gonna do more like a Wall Street letter, top tier cash rich and hedge mining companies only, exploring throughout the sector, not just gold and silver. We made big scores in Mali and copper and lithium and you know cobalt, I was one of the first on that ask them you know, that mineral. Nonetheless, I realized pretty quickly that if I didn't have some speculative type investments, uh, I'd probably not have a business because the whole industry is pretty much geared to these penny stocks. So it was very easy at the beginning because um, I have picked more stocks than the junior mining sector that have be, actually become mines than anybody else. 
Hmm. And that's, well, wait a minute, you're not a geologist. And uh, you know, how the heck did that happen? And it's very simple. When I started, it was the bottom of the market. Same time that, you know, Warren Buffett bought his physical silver supply it did, on a cash, or excuse me, on an inflation adjusted basis, lowest price it ever been. So all the little junior companies that were still up on the boards, which was just like a handful, were there for a reason. These guys that owned them gave up their second home, their you know fishing boat, their sports car, or what have you, to continue to own those projects. So it was like the best of the best were the only ones on the board. So I just chose from those. So actually, it was you know I consider it be easy pickings. That's what happened. But as the market heated up, more and more, you know, Johnny come lately, Moose Pasture with a good promoter behind it, got into the Ford. Some of those made a lot of money, even though they had no merit. So you gotta be careful. I teach, you know, on those type of speculations, that way you can afford to lose. And if the company, and only if the company does what its mission statement says or close to it, and there's a material change in the company, then what I teach is what very few do, and that's to add to the position. Because you're now in a new company with merit, you know that discovery's been made, you know that there's going to be a preliminary economic assessment, you know stocks going to run for a while, and this is where someone like myself, and excuse the bragging, but I have a lot of experience, will help you get out the top and not get too greedy, because uh, even though the stock might be worth X based on some sound financial analysis. It may not get to X for 10 years because until that mine's built, you're not gonna get the cash flow. One thing I noticed just looking at the charts for gold versus gold mining shares, not necessarily silver, but it's probably pretty similar. In the 2000 to 2010 and nine run, uh, 11 run, you know, I, the miners seemed to outperform bullion. And then in this bear market that pretty much proceeded since, obviously the mining shares underperformed bullion. And even till now, they've been s slowly catching up, but bullion has done pretty well, especially with the shortages that have gone on in terms of premium. My expectation though, is that at some point there'll be another shortage and it'll be acute this time. It'll probably be worldwide. And you may have a situation where bullion premiums get silly. Uh, and that it may be the time for me personally to sell out of some of that bullion and move into some mining shares, hire a guy like you, an expert with a lot more uh, wisdom in, in that department and take some advice from you uh, on that. So thank you for that. Um, number eight, a little information can mean a lot more dollars. Yeah, I'm reading you don't have to be a student of the silver market to profit from your metals investments. However, you'll greatly increase your chances of success and the size of your potential profits if you understand the fundamental factors that drive silver prices and pay regular attention to the current supply and demand consideration. So, you know, I'm not the only one. There's a few letters that specialize in silver. I don't, I sit, well, I, I guess I could say I specialize in silver, but we look across the board. Uh, you know, right now we've done really good in uranium. We've got gold, we've got other assets. But the point being, sometimes it pays for advice. Sometimes it doesn't. The newsletter business is a tough one because you can't generally, you know, you get what you pay for. In other words, you know, if you pay more for a premium refrigerator freezer, you usually are getting your money's worth in most cases. But in the newsletter business, it's pretty hard. I mean, you might pay some, you know, a thousand year, two thousand year, uh, and they may not be as good as a two hundred dollar letter. But uh, anyway, enough said. So number nine, collecting silver is an art, but not really an investment. Yeah, I only find silver items. This is. This is, I'll just read it because this is where a few people, not many, but it's worth the most why I wrote the rule. It's worth sure. making sure people understand what they're doing. So owning silver items, including rare coins, can provide great enjoyment and personal satisfaction. Like paintings and other artworks, they are beautiful and often quite valuable. And if you are astute at buying and selling, they can generate large profits. So I don't think I could be more gut honest than that in yep. one sentence. In spite of this, however, always use such holdings as collectibles, not investments. When you need your silver or simply want to cash it in, you do not want to have difficulty selling or being forced to forfeit a large aesthetic premium, both of which are likely to occur in silver rallies. And that's the end of what I wrote. I'll just add, especially in trying or tough economic times. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Premiums are one of the biggest things to vanish when you're talking about 
instant liquidity and you have a forced fire sale you know you only have so many people and you don't have so much time who potentially would think twice about paying the premium that you hope for and so having for me you know when it comes to silver bullion i like to have silver bullion hallmarks that are well known well recognized well liquid and you can sell them in any market not just in the united states but all around the world they're recognized and so you know sticking with the products that are the most well known the ones that you like the most um, make most sense I, you know, obviously there's sovereign bullion coins, maybe their premiums are a little too high right now, then you should look at the most well-respected private mints, uh, Sunshine Minting. Um, let's see what else. There's, there's Asahi Refinery that's based out of the United States now. There's a whole bunch of various mints that are well-known, well-respected around, you know, the United States and around the world that, you know, you don't necessarily need to buy sovereign mint coins. You can buy bullion rounds or bullion bars as well. So it's- Very good, Pam or Herreras or some correct. of these- major mentors that have their hallmark on a exactly. silver wafer or whatever those are very liquid issues so thanks for pointing that out by the way probably if i had to do silver that probably be the one change i would make thanks sure uh number 10 the final rule of the morgan reports 10 rules for silver investing more than 10 percent is too much of a good thing now we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion here because obviously that's changed since uh so go right ahead take it take it away yeah you know i don't want anyone to get hurt trying to help I'm a, you know, I know monetary history, it's a passion and, you know, all these fiat things fail, you know, as I've said so many times, three words, all fiat things. So knowing that doesn't mean, again, that you have to load up the boat and go all in with gold and silver and that's the only asset. I think that's uh, a bit reckless unless, you know, that's your personal choice. It's well thought out and you've decided, you know, that's best for you or your family. Having said that, I just made rule number 10, which is to me, one in 10 are probably the two most important in this whole 10 rules. More than 10% too much of it is too much of a good thing. No matter how good the market looks or how worried you are about the future of civilized society, you must always remember that silver should make up only a small portion of a well-diversified portfolio. I recommend committing no more than 10% of the average portfolio of silver, regardless of how strong you feel about the potential of the metals market. And then, as you said, I, and that's in print, can of take it back, don't regret saying that, but uh, I put a note in there, as you know, James, that uh, after it was published, I think it was about three years later, I was speaking in, uh, at the Money Show in San Francisco, California, and from the uh, behind the lectern standing on the podium, I said that I've con considered going up to 20, 25%, because uh, this is before the big move from, I think, the Bush administration into the Middle East. And so I said, I feel 20, 25% is more appropriate than original 10% per the book of global investors, uh, investing rules. <clears throat> At the time it was published, the economic conditions were more stable, but now the world is in a war environment and a higher allocation is necessary. And just go one step further, of course, I want your input. Um, in 19, uh, I forget what year, but now it's about five, six years ago, CPM Group did a study from 1968 forward to whatever year, I'm going to guess about four or five years ago, and determined that 25% was the correct asset allocation to gold. We're talking silver, but that was high uh, relative to my 10%, but that is what the math showed. I mean, it's just a fact. It's not bias it's just what is the best balance to portfolio you really need precious metals in a balanced portfolio so ifs ands or buts about it we're going back to you know our discussion i mean if you know everyone owned a little or everyone owned 10 percent i mean think about that yeah, right yeah, of course so let me hand it to you yeah and i did a, a video recently about you know what it takes to be a silver whale on sd bullion's youtube channel if you simply search silver whale sd bullion in youtube you'd find it and it really gets into the real heart of the details, like the minute 10 or so in, where I go into the high net worth category, you know, how many billionaires and 50 more are, 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 are more million uh, dollar estates that are in the world. There are tens of thousands of these folks, hundreds of thousands, actually. And um, they only in their allocations, when you look at the data uh, through uh, Frank Knight, Tim, uh, Frank Knight, I believe, did the research. And also it's corroborated, corroborated by Credit Suisse's research. Uh, most of these people only have very low single digits to any allocation to precious metals. And I, of course, in my personal opinion, I, I think that we're heading into a fiat currency crisis of 
of confidence essentially. And so what you're gonna end up having, I think is a lot of these people freaking out and going toward precious metals in a high volume. And if they do, there will be bullion shortages acutely around the world. Like kind of we saw in 2020 and 2021, a little bit building. Um, 2020 during the COVID acute phase in spring was really, really strong in terms of how difficult it was to get physical. I mean, comics had to literally come out and start taking on Chinese refineries uh, Russian refineries, Turkish refineries. I mean, no one's doing the ML in any of these places. We have no idea how much blood gold has been funneled through the comics because of this reason. I mean, it is that acute. It was that acute that they were willing to take on adversaries, supposedly, of the United States government and just let them funnel right through our commodity market. So it was very acute, and 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 I. It's just a forewarning of what's coming. And I just think that was just a that was just a forewarning and a foretaste of what's ahead. And so. What you cited, the CPM Group uh, study from 1968 to 2016, I think he did, he's updated it recently, Jeffrey Christian has. It's a very good study, and it, it studies against the S&P 500 just in general, and then it also studies against U.S. bonds and treasuries, and then also bullion allocation. And what is the perfect mix? And he came up with the risk-reward ratio of the last almost 50 years in this full fiat currency experiment. That 25% gold bullion allocation was the perfect risk-reward ratio over that entire time span. Now, obviously, we could go back and cherry pick time frames where platinum bullion made most sense to own or where silver bullion made most sense to own. My suggestion is you probably want to own all three <laughs> in different various amounts. And uh, depending on your uh, your age and your object, your objectives, I mean, essentially, if you're looking to preserve exactly the savings that you've accumulated to this date, gold bullion makes total sense because it's less volatile. If you're looking to actually get gains in value, silver bullion makes a lot of sense. If you have a longer term time frame and you want something that, that also has a good value proposition right now, platinum also makes good sense. Uh, but platinum has a longer, uh, I think a longer uh, runway for it to go into a manic space than, than perhaps silver or gold. Silver or gold, I think the time is starting to tick on those two. And in the next few years, we may see a real crazy mania form in both those those markets. So it, let, me, let me suggest this. It's not even if you live, if you suffer under a full fiat currency regime, as we all do globally, you have to have some physical gold or silver, especially when the central banks are collectively, you know, hell bent on creating this fiat CBDC grid where they can have full control, full, full insight into what's going on with your capital. To have some physical bullion that's private, that's outside of their privy, makes complete sense. It makes complete common sense. And if, you know, you want to pass it along to your heirs, so be it. It's not as if they have to know or track or trace it. You could actually do that in a, in a way that's smart and, and, and private. And, and that's what a lot of our customer base feels. A lot of them buy silver knowing even if it goes up a wall, I'm still just going to give it away to my kids. I'm not worried. And so it, it really depends on your objectives again. And so I, I suppose the, the, the 10% rule makes sense. And I think the 10% rule, by the way, and I'm sure you could, could agree, I think that came out in like the late 1970s, some of the studies that were made uh, or early 1980s, back when gold and silver were much higher in value versus other financial asset classes. And so now they're much lower versus the bubble asset classes that we're looking at. And so being very aggressive in your bullion allocation or your precious metals portfolio allocation, I think right now makes sense. If we're, you know, spot silver is over $50 an ounce and gold is running beyond 3000 an ounce, then maybe you, you start taking some profits here or there. Uh, but that is, I think the point right now in this day and age, $25 spot silver and almost 2000 spot gold. Yeah. I love your thinking and you're very succinct and just, you know, shout it right out. The idea is, you know, at ten percent, as you said, that's when silver, you know, gold actually were valued higher, as far as what it was relative to the other asset classes. And now you might—I don't know if this is going to make sense. Hopefully, it does. You know, twenty-five percent now is like owning ten percent back in the seventies. And if you go a step further, you know, with the crypto mania that's gone on for years on and off now, the last few years, which I'm not against. I'm free market. You want cryptos? Go for it. I'm involved, as I said. But the only way to get those Bitcoin-like returns up until the last decade was junior mining stocks, basically. Yeah, there were occasional New York Stock Exchange stocks that went cuckoo crazy. But generally speaking, if you were looking for that 10, 20, 30 bagger, where you received those the most was either in oil exploration or mineral exploration. Those days have not gone away, but the focus has been primarily on the new assets. So David, to wrap this all up, I, thank you so much for going through the 10 rules. Obviously people could find it, the morganreport.com, 10 rules for silver investing. I'm gonna put the link in the show notes below and we really do appreciate your time, David. I wanna ask you, you know, obviously you got into the silver um, space, you became a metals head, as you said, uh, probably because when you saw the 
the loss of silver coinage perhaps in the United States and how people really weren't paying attention. And now, now we're at a situation where the penny and the nickel are literally going to start disappearing because the actual melt value is worth more than the face value. And they'll make up some excuse and say it's because the COVID or what have you, it's not turning over. But we all know the truth. We all know Argentina. We know the history of all these various places where the coins become worth more in melt than they are in the face value. So they start disappearing because people take advantage of that fact, regardless of what silly human law they ever write down or try and force. They're not going to be able to enforce it and they'll start disappearing. I know it's a long-winded question. I guess I wanted to get to the point of Obviously, when you look out for silver, and there's probably some things that you think in terms of valuation, where it could go, what are some of the moments in time or some of the main valuation cases, you know, silver versus this or that, where you think in terms of, well, that might be about time to start taking some pro profits and moving it elsewhere and somewhere else in my life? Hopefully not too long went in an answer. I looked at that and I did, a, you could still find it called engineering the price of gold. And then, then I discussed gold and silver and paper terms back in about 2003. I give some evaluations based on that. And then I think one of the easiest ways is to look at, um, you know, what is silver worth in value? And all value in the economic system comes from human labor. Whether it's manual labor, a man running a machine, a woman running a machine, or intellectual property, it has to do with labor. So if you look at uh, the, the aggregate, the mean, what the average person makes in the United States, it's about $28 an hour. And if you take a day's labor <clears throat> times eight, you're doing about you know, 30 times eight, 240 bucks. And that's probably what an ounce of silver is worth. And really a dollar three quarters of an ounce. So you could actually say, you could make a case for $300 silver right. based on historic value when we were not in a fiat fiasco. Mm -hmm. And the last point about that is that all markets in distress go from undervalued to fair value, which I just suggested, the fair value of silver, to overvalued. And where we're headed is going to take silver to an overvalued condition, same with gold. And I base that on monetary history throughout the ages and my recent, you know, not my so much recent history, but in my lifetime. Because if we did that engineering the price of gold, Exercise, you'll find out that the fair value of gold was $400 an ounce, and yet it got over double that to $850. So that suggests in the next run, which will be worldwide, not US centric, it won't be the Hunt brothers, it'll be everyone in the world hunting for silver. When that happens, you're going to see an overvaluation. So you could take that and say, oh, David's full of it, he's talking his own book, blah, 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 say whatever you wish. I'm here to help. And I'm here to speak the truth to the best of my ability to make sure as many people as possible understand what you, James, have done such a good job of and all of my friends in the precious metals industry. Yeah, we got to make a living and blah, blah. But the point is that most of us have a good, strong heart and a good, strong mental capability to critically think outside of the government paradigm in order to preserve our wealth for ourselves and our posterity. David Morgan of the morganreport.com. I really, really want to thank you for coming on as Steve Boehm's YouTube channel today and for giving our listeners and our viewers some insights with your wise 10 rules for silver investing. And as well, I believe everything you just said about looking out in the future, I think from undervaluation to fair value to overvaluation is where this goes. And uh, having someone, a sage, wise person like you around to help people along the, the, you know, in those times because they're going to get crazy and they will get delusional. Um, having someone that's more grounded and someone who has experience scars to prove it. Um, you know, you being there to help them and help your subscribers along, I think will be very, very beneficial for them. So David Morgan, thanks so much for coming on. James, always a pleasure to interface with you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to give our video a thumbs up to keep getting bullion related news and industry insights. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. Finally hit that alert button. So you know, when we publish fresh content.